Hey guys, welcome back to General Chemistry Lab. And um, we're going to do our, our last um, experiment of the semester for Chem 120. This is rates of reaction. Now, you guys will be um, analyzing some pre-recorded kinetics data for this reaction that we're about to take a look at. But I thought it'd be good for you guys to actually see which reaction that we're studying. So you can read about this in the procedure of your um, an introduction of your lab, um, um, lab protocol. Um, but this is a reaction between um, I minus, um, so the iodide ion, and um, the persulfate ion, which is um, S2082 minus. Um, now the reagents that we're using have potassium counter ion, so we're actually going to react Ki, potassium iodide, and um, K2S2O8, which is potassium perisulfate, or persulfate. Um, so, we're going to take a look at part one in your procedure. Um, I made some modifications just so that we can um, see some other things dealing with this reaction. Um, so, in part one, you're asked to set up two Erlenmeyer flasks which I did here. So I have a solution A, which is on my right and your left, and a solution B that's on your right and my left. Okay, um, so solution A contains 10 um, milliliters of Ki and um, 20 milliliters of deionized water, and solution B contains um, 20 milliliters of Ki um, and 10 milliliters of deionized water. Um, so this is so that the solutions are the same volume, but solution A contains less Ki than solution B. Um, so we're going to see how the concentration of the Ki affects um, the rate of this reaction. Um, so to start the reaction, which is what you would do um, for all the trials that you see are done for um, this experiment, is I'm going to add the other reagent from a graduated cylinder. So in my graduated cylinder here, um, and I have two of them, I have 20 milliliters of the potassium persulfate. Okay, and I'm going to add both of those at about the same time. And um, the rest of our setup here, I have the flasks on a stir plate um, and, and stirring with a magnetic stir bar. So this is how you would actually carry out this reaction in all trials um, for this experiment. All right, so let's add our two reagents together and see what happens. So I'm gonna try to add them at the same time. So one, two, three, let's go. Okay. So, um, little easy but then I have the flat parts. So um, you can see for both of these reactions um, the solution is turning yellow. It's going from clear to yellow um, and that yellow color is actually coming from one of the products of this reaction which is I2 um, which is slightly soluble in water um, and it's a brownish um, yellowish color. So um, the more intense the color, the higher concentration of iodine that's in the solution. Now another thing that you'll notice is that solution B is darker than solution A. And the reason why that is is because we use more Ki. So the concentration um, of Ki is affecting the rate of this reaction, um, something that you're going to explore in part two when you determine the rate law for this reaction. Okay, so you might ask yourself, how am I supposed to determine a rate of reaction here? We have no way of knowing the concentration of the I minus that's being formed in solution. Um, so, this is where um, one of the other reagents used in this experiment comes in. Um, so that reagent is um, sodium thiosulfate. So sodium thiosulfate I have in the beaker here, right in the middle, and that um, solution is actually mixed in with some starch solution, so about 0.4% um, starch, 
You might remember starch from a couple of other reactions we ran this semester. Um, starch actually turns a um, bluish black color in solution when it's in the presence of I2. So it's a way to detect iodine in solution. Um, and it's used in this, re in this um, experiment to detect the appearance um, of I2. So I'm going to add the solution of sodium thiosulfate and starch. I'm going to add it to solution B. We're going to see what happens. So let's start. Now you notice that it's turning darker and darker, and eventually the color disappears. So why is the color disappearing? So it turned a little bit of a darker, you can see a little bit of the blue color there. But why did it turn, why did it turn clear again? Well, sodium thiosulfate reacts with I2 in solution to form some more iodine ions which are colorless in solution. Um, so we call sodium thiosulfate a scavenger for iodine. It reacts with iodine to form I minus. And, um, and that's what we're using it for in this, in this experiment. And eventually, if we let this stir for a little bit longer, I don't know, I added a lot of sodium thiosulfate, so we'll see how long it takes. But that gives me some time to explain some things here. So we're using sodium thiosulfate, and you'll notice for um, at least part two of the experiment, the concentration of sodium thiosulfate is going to be held constant. Um, so the reason why it's going to be held constant is because we want to know how long does it take for that sodium thiosulfate to run out and give us the blue-black color for, for the iodine. Um, so, so we're going to look at the rate of disappearance of that thick sodium thiosulfate over the time it takes for the solution to go from colorless, which it is here, back to that blue-black color. Um, and that's how we're going to measure the, the um, rate of reaction. So this is why we call this an iodine clock reaction. The clock is actually the thiosulfate solution because we're using its change in concentration from the initial concentration in solution to zero to, um, uh, to, to figure out the initial rate of reaction. So it's very important that when you do your rate um, calculations, that the um, we use the rate calculation. It's very important that you use the concentration of thiosulfate because we only know that when the color change happens from colorless back to a blue black color, which hopefully we'll get to see pretty soon. I don't know. I added a lot of thiosulfate. Um, that um, we'll know at that point we have um, we've ran out of thiosulfate, it's gone to zero, and, and that's what we can use um, the time, that time for our rate calculation. So although the concentration of thiosulfate is remaining the same, um, the time that it takes is gonna depend on the two reagents as we see here in this demonstration. I don't know about this, let's see. Let's see if we can add, what happens if we add some thiosulfate over here. Dark. It doesn't get to turn clear. Okay, so we'll wait a couple minutes here to see what happens. turning is turning. So the solution got slightly darker here. There's a lot of water in there so it doesn't get as dark as we'd like. But it did go from colorless to sort of a dark color there. Okay and that's sort of what we're looking for. Although with um, lower concentrations of our reagents you're gonna definitely see a more intense color. 
if we let this go for a little longer, the color will actually get more and more intense as it's doing now. Okay, there you have it. That's how our iodine clock reaction is going to work for this experiment. Um, so I hope you learned a lot about this reaction and um, you know, stay safe and healthy um, as we remain in quarantine. Miss you guys around Pittsburgh. It's pretty quiet without you. Haven't spent a lot of time in Oakland, but um, definitely in the shady side area of Giant Eagle and Target's been pretty quiet. Okay, bye guys.